Um, hello, everyone. I'm Judy Krasna, and I'm the executive director of FEAST. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Before I introduce Dr. Sarah Raven, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Please keep your camera and microphone off at all times. If you have a question for Dr. Raven, please write it in the chat box, and we will get to as many questions as time allows. FEAST relies on donations to run programs like this webinar. If you would like to support FEAST so that we can continue offering educational programming to the parent community, you can find a link to our donations page in the chat box. And now, it is truly an honor to welcome Dr. Raven. Dr. Raven is in solo private practice in Coral Gables, Florida, where she provides assessment and treatment for children, adolescents, and young adults with eating disorders, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, body dysmorphia, and related issues. Dr. Raven is a firm believer in true collaboration between parents and treatment providers, which is why she is such a valued member of FEAST Advisory Board and a true friend of FEAST. Dr. Raven specializes in both FBT and CBT and is an active member of the Academy for Eating Disorders and the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. We are honored and grateful to have Dr. Raven here with us today. Dr. Raven. Thank you, Judy. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a difficulty getting my slideshow started here. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Judy, for that introduction. Um, I am thrilled to be here. I've been a big supporter of FEAST ever since its inception, and FEAST has been a tremendous support for so many of the families that I work with. Um, I believe that parent-to-parent -parent support is extremely valuable, and um, I'm honored to be here to be able to give this presentation. Um, so what is ARFID? ARFID is an acronym for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Um, ARFID is characterized by a pattern of limited or restricted eating, which is associated with a variety of either social, emotional, medical, nutritional, or developmental consequences. The person's reason for restricting their food intake it can vary. So for some individuals, the food restriction has to do with sensory sensitivity, um, maybe disliking or being averse to a variety of different textures or tastes or smells of food. Uh, for other individuals, they seem to just not really have much of a biological drive to eat. They don't seem to get much pleasure from eating. They may not have hunger cues or may not be able to respond to them the way that other people do. Um, and yet for others, it may be a fear of the negative consequences of eating. So for example, a fear of vomiting after eating, a fear of choking on food, a fear of having severe abdominal pain, a fear of an allergic reaction or something of that nature. So what ARFID is not is it is not something that is related to body image, drive for thinness or fear of weight gain. So we very rarely see body image distortion with ARFID. Um, in fact, those individuals with ARFID that are underweight are typically very aware that they're underweight, may feel self-conscious about being underweight and may actually have a desire to gain weight, but simply have a very difficult time doing so. Um, ARFID is a very heterogeneous diagnostic group. So we tend to see a variety of different ages, genders, body types, personalities, and symptom presentations, much more so in ARFID than with any other eating disorder diagnosis. So just to kind of give you a sense of um, how heterogeneous this diagnostic group is, I'm going to give a few examples of different individuals with ARFID that I have treated. Um, so the first example was an eight-year-old girl 
who had always been uh, very healthy, uh, very active, and had been a great eater, ate a variety of different ethnic foods, fruits, vegetables, just about everything. Um, but then she stopped eating solid food abruptly after she choked on a vegetable. And um, sadly, right around that same time, within a week of that incident, uh, her grandfather also died of COVID. So I think the combination of the trauma of choking plus the death in the family for her um, caused a tremendous amount of fear around eating. Um, after she stopped eating solid food, she lost quite a bit of weight and then presented for treatment. Another example of a patient I've treated is a 21 year old average weight college student male um, who had suffered from social anxiety since he was very young and who was socially isolated due to his very limited palate. Um, so he was a senior in college, but he kind of ate like a preschooler, um, just like pasta with butter, chicken nuggets, and French fries. And um, it hadn't really affected him too much up to this point, but he was interested in dating. Um, he wanted to ask girls out and take them to nice restaurants and didn't want to order off the children's menu. Um, he was also applying to law school. So he was kind of thinking ahead that in the future, if he had business meetings with uh, colleagues or clients, he, again, wanted to eat like an adult. Um, Another example of a patient I've worked with was a 17-year-old girl with a very poor appetite, uh, very low BMI, little interest in food, and a history of bullying, actually. Uh, she was bullied for being underweight, um, which made her even more upset, which dwindled her appetite even more, which made it even harder for her to eat. And um, she suffered from a lot of like dizziness, um, lightheadedness, things of that nature because of the malnutrition. And then a final example of a patient I've worked with was an 11 year old boy um, who had extreme picky eating. Um, he had a higher BMI, so there was no nutritional compromise per se, um, but he ate only uh, three foods, chicken nuggets only from McDonald's, French fries only from McDonald's and Kraft macaroni and cheese. And in his particular case, um, there was a lot of strained family functioning surrounding his ARFID um, with some family members understanding and others not understanding and kind of different levels of accommodation. Um, so that's just to kind of give you a sense of um, snapshots of what different cases of ARFID may look like. A little bit about the history of ARFID. Um, ARFID was formerly, formally added to the DSM-5 in 2013. Uh, the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So it's kind of the Bible of psychology and psychiatry. It lists all of the different uh, psychiatric disorders that exist and their symptoms and how to diagnose them. So um, the, the fifth iteration of the DSM came out in 2013 and ARFID was listed as one of the eating disorders in that iteration. Um, prior to 2013, ARFID still existed. It was just, um, there were any number of different diagnostic categories that it may have fallen under. So for example, um, feeding disorder of infancy or early childhood, these would have been um, babies or young children who had a very difficult time eating. A failure to thrive is kind of a medical diagnosis that's often given to babies and young children who aren't growing as expected. Uh, selective eating disorder, um, that would be the um, kind of the case of the extreme picky eating. Um, food neophobia, which is um, a fear of trying new foods. Food avoidance emotional disorder, which is um, or was uh, an eating disorder that was kind of characterized by um, emotions about other things, maybe depression, anxiety, trauma that kind of manifested in the avoidance or restriction of food. Emetophobia, which is a fear of vomiting. Uh, Non-fat phobic anorexia nervosa, which is a term that I don't think we use much anymore, but we used to use for individuals who kind of medically, nutritionally, behaviorally looked like people with anorexia nervosa, but did not have uh, a drive for thinness or a fear of weight gain. Um, or finally, um, EDNOS, which is or was eating disorder not otherwise specified, which is kind of a, um, a very broad category for individuals with eating disorders that didn't fit neatly into any of the other categories. So a little bit about the epidemiology of ARFID. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to, to discern how prevalent it is because it is a relatively new 
diagnostic category that you know many um, physicians and, and parents and individuals just aren't familiar with, but it's estimated that the prevalence is somewhere in the ballpark of 0.3% um, to 3.2%. So roughly similar to the prevalence of anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Uh, the prevalence in males and females is just about equal. In fact, in, in some studies, it's found that the prevalence is slightly higher in males. Uh, the onset of ARFID is typically before age five. Um, oftentimes it's present from, you know, from infancy or toddlerhood, except for in some cases of um, the aversive subtype, which is uh, the case in which a person um, has a traumatic experience like choking or vomiting and then suddenly develops ARFID after that. Those cases can start later childhood, adolescence, or, or even adulthood sometimes. About 75% of people with ARFID also have a comorbid anxiety disorder. So anxiety is a huge um, uh, predisposing and perpetuating factor for, uh, for this particular eating disorder, even more so than for, for some of the other eating disorders. About 20% of individuals with ARFID are somewhere on the autism spectrum. And that's particularly so for um, individuals with um, with the, uh, the sensory difficulties, the issues with um, taste, texture, smell, those individuals are likely to be somewhere on the autism spectrum, not always. Um, the prevalence of mood disorders in ARFID tends to be quite a bit lower than it is with anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder. Um, people in those other eating disorder categories are much more likely to suffer from depression or bipolar disorder, but this is often not the case with ARFID. Um, and the average age at diagnosis for ARFID is usually in childhood or early adolescence. So even though it tends to begin in infancy or toddlerhood, um, they often don't make their way to specialist treatment until they are in late childhood, or early adolescence, because there's accommodation or no one knows what it is, or they're given um, advice that's not helpful or so on and so forth. So there tends to be a pretty, um, pretty long period of time, usually a number of years between the onset of the illness and seeking help. Amongst uh, kids, uh, children and adolescents in eating disorder specialty clinics, uh, about 15 to 22% of them have a diagnosis of ARFID. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about three different subtypes of ARFID. So we have the aversive subtype, the avoidant subtype, and the restrictive subtype. These subtypes are not mutually exclusive. So it's actually pretty common for a patient to have symptoms from two or even three of these different subtypes. Um, so the aversive subtype, um, these individuals are often normal eaters, um, maybe even great eaters before the onset of the ARFID. Um, the onset tends to be very sudden and tends to be triggered by some sort of trauma or extremely stressful experience surrounding food. Um, so, uh, for example, the individual may choke or vomit or have a severe allergic reaction, and then after that becomes very afraid of the food or the situations um, that are related to that particular trauma, or in some cases of all food. Um, and the person may either experience the food-related trauma themselves, or perhaps they witness a sibling, a family member, or a classmate um, who chokes or vomits on food, and then it's kind of like a vicarious trauma after that. The avoidance subtype, um, these, uh, these individuals tend to have difficulty with eating that dates way back to infancy or very early childhood. These are the kids that um, tend to be very sensitive to smells, tastes, textures of food. Um, they are often characterized by extremely picky eating. And this is the subtype that is often comorbid with autism spectrum disorders. So these individuals tend to have a lot of difficulty adjusting to baby food. So when they sort of are transitioning um, away from milk towards baby food and then into solid food, that's when these problems tend to begin. And then finally, um, the restrictive subtype. These are the individuals that, that seem to lack a biological drive to eat. Um, they may have a poor appetite, they may not experience hunger cues, or if they do experience hunger cues, they have trouble responding to them. Um, they don't seem to get much pleasure or enjoyment out of food. Uh, they tend to feel full easily. Um, food tends to be more of a chore um, or something that they dread or just that they have to get done rather than something that they look forward to. Um, oftentimes parents of kids with this subtype say that when the child was a baby, they had to set an alarm 
for every two or three hours um, to remind the child to eat, which as any parent knows, most babies come with their own alarm and they let us know when they're hungry. But for these kids, they don't come with their own internal alarm system. So oftentimes parents have to be the ones that start feeding them mechanically, even from a very, very young age. Um, I wanna talk a little bit now about uh, formulation or how we conceptualize ARFID. Um, and this formulation is particularly for the avoided and restrictive subtypes. So as with other types of eating disorders and, and really all um, psychiatric disorders and other medical conditions, um, these individuals tend to come with a biological predisposition that makes them more likely or more vulnerable to developing ARFID. So this biological predisposition almost always involves an anxious temperament and a hypersensitivity to body sensations. So these individuals are very, very in tune with how their body feels almost to a fault. Um, sometimes these individuals have extreme sensory sensitivity. Um, they tend to have a lot of cognitive rigidity, like they must do things a certain way. Um, so sometimes there can be some autism spectrum traits there and or some OCD type traits. Um, and then for the individuals with the restrictive subtype, there's often that lack of hedonic drive, meaning they don't get pleasure or enjoyment from food or, or other physical uh, sensations that most people do enjoy. So from that biological predisposition um, spring a lot of negative feelings, uh, negative thoughts, and negative beliefs about the consequences of eating. So for example, typical emotions that may come up for someone with uh, ARFID might be disgust, fear, or suspicion when they're faced with food. Um, so in some, in some people, uh, the disgust, fear, or suspicion is of any new foods, anything outside of their, um, their list of safe foods. And for some people, it may be all foods that bring up feelings of disgust or suspicion. Um, for those with the restrictive subtype, oftentimes there's apathy or indifference around food. Um, it's just like staring at a plate of nuts and bolts. It's not something that appetizes or that, that seems appetizing or appealing to them at all. So with these negative emotions come a lot of uh, thoughts and beliefs about eating food or what it might be like to eat a particular food. So for example, a thought might come up of, I won't like any new foods anyway, so I'm not even gonna bother trying. So then from those negative beliefs and thoughts um, about food and about the consequences of eating comes food restriction. And the food restriction can take a variety of different forms. In, in some people, it's a very limited variety of foods. So these individuals may have you know, four or five safe foods and they eat nothing but that. Um, in other individuals, it may be a limited quantity of foods. So perhaps they eat only until they're just you know, very, very slightly not hungry, but not until they're all the way full, um, especially for people who are afraid of vomiting or who are afraid of abdominal pain. Um, in some individuals, food restriction takes the form of skipping meals or snacks um, if their preferred foods are not available. Then, of course, with food restriction comes nutritional compromise. So the nutritional compromise might take the form of a vitamin deficiency and nutrient deficiency. Um, they may lose weight. They may fail to grow or develop normally. They may fail to proceed through puberty as expected. Um, in some cases, there may be excessive weight gain if it's a person who eats plenty of food, but only chicken nuggets and pizza, for example. So. Um, often, though not always, there's some sort of nutritional compromise involved. And then also we have uh, limited opportunities for exposure. So if someone is, um, is fearful or avoidant of foods, they may be very unlikely to put themselves in situations in which different foods are available. So they may avoid restaurants, they may avoid parties, sleepovers, school lunch, traveling, any situation where they're expected to eat around other people or when they're expected to eat different types of foods. So um, with these missed social opportunities, of course, there can be social isolation, there can be increased anxiety, um, sometimes depression, can set in, but also there's less uh, exposure to peer modeling. So if you don't go out to a Thai restaurant with your friends, you don't get to see all these other kids eating Thai food and hey, it's actually kind of good. Um, so they don't have a chance to disconfirm their negative beliefs and thoughts around food because they're kind of stuck in this little bubble of I only eat these certain foods and nothing else. 
Um, and then along with that, they tend to become very, very attentive to small changes in food presentation. So for example, some people will only eat Kraft macaroni and cheese, but won't eat any other brand. Um, so, and, and they tend to be much more attentive to um, food presentations or taste differences that most people may not even notice or care about. Um, so now I want to talk a bit about how we conceptualize or formulate the aversive subtype of ARFID, and this is the one that has the trauma component. So it, it's similar to the other subtypes, but there's a, a little bit of a twist because there's typically an event that sets it off. So with these individuals, yes, there's also a biological predisposition. Um, these people tend to come with an anxious temperament um, and they tend to be very, very sensitive to bodily sensations. So this hypersensitivity, these are often the, the types of kids that may experience panic attacks um, because they're so attuned to changes in their body and then they become anxious about being anxious, et cetera. Um, then there's the food related trauma, which again can be either something that the child themselves experiences or something that they witness in a family member or a friend or even something on TV. Um, it may be an episode of choking or vomiting or severe allergic reaction or something of, of that nature. It can even be um, a fear of feeling extremely full and how uncomfortable that may be. So once the person experiences this food-related trauma, either in themselves or witnessing it in someone else, their body goes into fight or flight mode. So um, there becomes, uh, there's a lot of fear and avoidance and resistance around, either around that particular um, food or that particular situation or sometimes food altogether. Then after the food-related trauma, in part because of the trauma and in part because of the biological predisposition, a lot of negative thoughts and beliefs about food and eating spring up. So these individuals tend to overestimate the likelihood of repeat trauma. So for example, a little girl that I've worked with who um, choked once on a vegetable and was, um, she, she turned blue, but she was fine, you know, she survived. Um, she actually believed that there was a 90% chance that she would choke again if she ate solid food which I don't have hard data on this, but I think the likelihood of, of choking again is probably quite small, especially once a person is very cautious and chewing their food very well. Um, and these individuals also tend to underestimate their ability to cope. Um, they tend to underestimate their resilience. So if something bad did happen, for example, if I went to school and I ate school food and I vomited in front of my peers, that would be absolutely horrible and I'd never recover. Whereas, yes, that would be embarrassing, but most people would probably move on from that. So then with kind of the combination, the biological predisposition, the food-related trauma, and these negative thoughts and beliefs about food comes the nutritional compromise, comes the limited opportunities for exposure, and also the food restriction. Um, so with the nutritional compromise, in some cases, the person undereats. In some cases, the person um, experiences weight loss or failure to gain weight or grow as expected. Um, some people tend to develop gastrointestinal symptoms that actually reinforce the undereating or anxiety. So this is pretty common in people who have kind of underlying gastrointestinal issues. They, they do have legitimate GI issues, but then the anxiety about eating amplifies that and vice versa. So it kind of becomes this vicious cycle. Um, then with limited opportunities for exposure, they don't have an opportunity to disconfirm their negative predictions about the consequences of eating. And um, of course, then that leads to food restriction. So um, some people avoid all situations or types of foods associated with the trauma. And in some cases, it becomes an even broader, uh, an even broader avoidance of all food, which of course is very, very dangerous. So when, um, when I see someone with ARFID in my practice, um, I like to look at kind of the clinical significance in order of priority. So in terms of evaluating someone and prioritizing treatment goals, um, we start from the quality of their nutritional intake. So the most important question to ask is, is this person eating well enough 
to maintain their health and well-being. So, um, and, and what is good enough? Well, that depends entirely on the situation. Is the person eating a sufficient, um, you know, quantity and variety of food to, um, to get all their vitamin needs, to get all their mineral needs, um, to give them enough energy um, so that their body functions properly and they're not dizzy? Um, are they getting their period regularly if they're a postmenarchal female? Um, do they have enough strength to participate in the sport that they enjoy, et cetera? So is their nutritional intake good enough? for their purposes. Then we wanna ask um, what impact does the ARFID have on their growth and development? So in some cases, these kids might be growth stunted. In some cases, they might have lost weight, uh, which is almost always a problem in a child or adolescent. Um, in some cases, puberty is delayed. So there may be a girl who's you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old and hasn't yet had her first period, hasn't had any breast development. Um, so these are the things that we wanna look at next. So as you can see, like the person's basic physiological needs um, have to take priority because without that, without a nourished body and a nourished brain, it's very difficult, if not impossible to focus on the other important uh, therapeutic elements of their treatment. So next we want to look at the impact of the ARFID on family functioning and sometimes vice versa. So it's pretty common for, um, for ARFID to cause conflict within a family. Oftentimes parents have different ideas about how to manage the child's ARFID. Sometimes one parent believes there's a serious problem and the other doesn't. The other thinks it's a phase that they'll grow out of, etc. cetera. Um, in many cases, there's a lot of family accommodation. So the family may avoid restaurants, vacations, um, social gatherings, family reunions, et cetera, which of course causes the family to become more isolated and limits their contact with other individuals. Um, and then also in some cases, um, other family issues may impact the child with ARFID. So for example, if there's conflict between the parents or between a parent and sibling about something else, that may make it more challenging for the child with ARFID to eat sufficiently. Um, next, we wanna look at the impact on social emotional functioning. So is the individual able to do the things that most individuals their age do? So for a child, can they go to school? You know, can they go to play dates with other kids? Can they participate in some sort of extracurricular activities? Um, if it is a college student, you know, can they attend class? Can they, you know, go out to parties or social gatherings? Um, can they hold down a part-time job, et cetera? Next, we want to assess for any comorbid conditions. Um, so with ARFID, we very often see a comorbid anxiety disorder. Um, we may often see a comorbid autism spectrum disorder. And then another thing to bear in mind is that, you know, having ARFID as a young child is actually a risk factor for developing another type of eating disorder later in life. So often um, individuals with ARFID as young children may develop anorexia nervosa um, after puberty. So that's something to bear in mind as well, because of course that complicates the clinical picture. And then finally, um, we want to look at the patient's subjective distress. So what is their quality of life? Uh, what bothers the patient about this issue? You know, do they believe they have a problem with food? And if so, why is it a problem? Um, to what extent does it interfere with the life that they want to live? So the treatments for ARFID really are all, because this is a pretty new diagnostic category, um, this is all sort of in its infancy, but the treatments that exist are all adaptations of other treatments that have an evidence base for treating other eating disorders. So first we have uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. So CBT um, for children and young adolescents always involves family involvement. Uh, family tends to play a very strong role in the CBT. It involves psychoeducation, both for the patient and for the parents, and a lot of self-monitoring, um, which can be done either by the patient if they're a teenager or an adult, or by the parents if it's a child or maybe a less um, cooperative adolescent. And uh, the CBT tends to target the maintaining mechanism. So what is it that is maintaining this 
eating disorder. Um, the eating disorder is very often maintained by avoidance. Um, so avoiding particular foods, particular situations, um, that tends to perpetuate the symptoms. Um, under eating tends to kind of perpetuate itself. So the less the person eats, the less they want to eat and so on and so forth. And then um, a lot of the thoughts and beliefs around food also serve to, uh, to maintain or perpetuate the eating disorder. And those are targeted in CBT as well. Next, we have family-based treatment or FBT, which is the gold standard first line of defense for children and adolescents with anorexia nervosa as well as bulimia nervosa. So with an adaptation of FBT for ARFID, um, it, it actually looks quite similar to FBT for anorexia nervosa. We start by increasing um, the parents' urgency and mobilizing the parents' anxiety, which in the case of ARFID can often be harder than for anorexia nervosa. So in the case of a child with anorexia nervosa, very often they are a normal eater, a healthy person, you know, um, growing normally. And then all of a sudden at age 13 or 14, you know, they fall off their growth chart, they start restricting their food intake, they lose a lot of weight, etc. Whereas for, for a child with ARFID, um, they may have been suffering for, you know, 10, 12 years um, prior to coming in for treatment. And so it's, there's, there's a lot of um, fatigue in, in the child and in the family of having dealt with this problem for so long. And also a sense of, well, my child's already made it to age 12 or 13 or 14 and they're still okay. So, you know, so it can be harder to recognize the situation as a crisis with ARFID than it is for another type of eating disorder. Um, so in FBT for ARFID, we work to empower the parents to take responsibility for helping the child meet their treatment goals. Um, and initially in treatment in the first phase, the parents hold that responsibility, but later in, as we get into phase two of FBT, the, the responsibility for meeting treatment goals um, is transferred back to the child or adolescent or young adult, whoever it may be. And then finally, in the third phase of FBT, we work to help the, the individual establish a healthy identity separate from the ARFID that they've typically been suffering for for a very long time. Then finally, we have some medical interventions. Um, in some cases, individuals with ARFID may need to be hospitalized for medical instability, either for bradycardia or hypotension um, or electrolyte imbalances, particularly if there's a lot of vomiting involved. Um, some individuals may need a feeding tube if they are not able to take in enough nutrients orally. That's fairly uncommon with ARFID, but it does happen. And then finally, there are some medications that are used with ARFID. Now, all of these medications are, are off-label. Um, to my knowledge, there aren't any FDA-approved medications for ARFID, but um, doctors will often extrapolate and kind of um, use medications that have been found effective for similar conditions. So for example, um, there's a medication called periactin or seprohypnidine, which is an antihistamine that's often used to stimulate appetite. Um, there's another medication called mirtazapine or Remeron, which is an antidepressant that kind of has a side effect of stimulating appetite and causing weight gain. Sometimes benzodiazepines, such as um, Ativan or Xanax or lorazepam, can be used um, as needed to help manage acute anxiety. Um, Olanzapine or Zyprexa is an atypical antipsychotic that can be used to help decrease anxiety, uh, decrease cognitive rigidity, and also has the convenient side effect of weight gain. And then finally, sometimes doctors will use SSRIs such as um, Prozac or Lexapro or Zoloft um, to help the patient manage their anxiety or particularly obsessive compulsive symptoms when those are present. So when I'm working with an individual um, and family with ARFID, I like to put together an individualized ARFID toolbox. Um, so that toolbox is going to look different depending on that patient and their symptoms and goals and the family's strengths and, and goals as well. So there are a number of different strategies that can be used. Um, we would never use all of these strategies with any one patient, but kind of pick and choose based on what that person needs. So for individuals who are not consuming enough calories or and or um, have not um, grown or gained weight as expected, we have a lot of different strategies for increasing caloric intake. So 
There are strategies such as using um, liquid nutrition, uh, Ensure or Boost, um, high calorie shakes and smoothies are often used. Um, eating uh, six times a day is frequently recommended. Um, using supplements such as Benacalorie or Carnation Instant Breakfast. Uh, fortifying foods with oils and things of that nature, um, eating very nutrient dense foods um, to try to pack more calories and nutrients into a smaller volume. These are all things that, you know, parents of um, kids with other types of eating disorders, such as anorexia nervosa, um, use frequently in their treatment as well. Sometimes we use a food hierarchy. So uh, a hierarchy is a strategy that's used in a lot of different types of cognitive behavioral therapy for um, for anxiety. So what we tend to do is we'll come up with a list of uh, about 10 different foods that the individual wants to be able to conquer. And we'll rank those from most challenging to least challenging. And then we'll kind of work our way up the ladder. So the person starts with an exposure to the least challenging food. Once they've mastered that, we move on to the next one and the next one and so on and so forth, which tends to have the effect of increasing the person's confidence and motivation to move forward. Exposure therapy is another very common uh, technique that's used in a lot of different types of CBT for anxiety disorders, PTSD, and OCD. Um, exposure therapy for ARFID can take a, a few different forms. Um, in some cases, it's exposure to feared foods or feared food situations, such as restaurants, parties, um, um, things of that nature. In some cases, it's interoceptive exposure, which means exposure to bodily sensations that the person finds um, very aversive, such as um, a feeling of being very full or uh, the feeling of swallowing and having a lot of food in their throat due to fear of choking. Cognitive therapy, again, is very frequently used in the treatment of anxiety, depression, um, and other mental health issues. Um, we, with cognitive therapy, we learn to identify and challenge uh, some of the thoughts and beliefs that are unhelpful or that are keeping the person stuck in the ARFID. Food chaining um, is a way of kind of um, gradually transitioning from a preferred food to a food that the person desires to eat. So for example, if a person um, is eating potato chips and they want to be able to eat uh, raw vegetables, they may start off with potato chips with a few little veggie straws mixed in and then just a bowl of veggie straws. And from there, maybe moving on to veggie straws with a couple of little carrots and then graduating to like carrots with a particular type of dip. So sort of gradually transitioning from a preferred food to a food that a person wants to be able to eat little by little. Fading in is a technique that we often use for people who have a, a fear of vomiting. So um, for example, a person who won't eat solid food due to a fear of vomiting, we may start off with apple juice and then we move on to applesauce. And then we move on to applesauce with little tiny chunks of apples in it. And then applesauce with larger chunks of apples. And then um, an apple cut into quarters. And then finally a full apple. So it, in that way, it's, it's kind of similar to introducing a baby to solid food. So we do that pretty gradually as well as the baby gets more teeth and is able to swallow more. Deconstructing foods. Um, so this involves like gradually um, becoming more comfortable with different components of a food um, in the service of eventually eating the full food. So for example, if someone wants to be able to eat pizza, which is common because um, it's kind of a staple of kids' parties and sleepovers and whatnot, um, we might start off with first having them eat the dough and then on a different, uh, different occasion, have them eat the, the cheese and then a different occasion, have them eat the sauce, and then another occasion, the pepperoni, and then kind of mix and match different permutations of those ingredients until finally they're eating the full slice of pizza. Um, there's a strategy called food detective, which tends to, to, be, uh, to be most effective with children, um, particularly those who have sensory issues around food. So we learn to you know, take a piece of food during the session and explore it with all five of our senses. And the idea behind this is to help the person learn to approach versus avoid the foods that they find um, disgusting or aversive or that they're afraid of. Relaxation training, which again is often used in um, cognitive behavioral therapy for different types of anxiety disorders um, that may involve deep breathing, meditation, 
mindfulness strategies, progressive muscle relaxation, yoga, things that help to relax the body and the mind um, to help the person manage the anxiety that they have around food. Values work, which comes from ACT, acceptance and commitments therapy. Um, that is sort of looking at or, or helping the patient to define what it is that they value, what it is that they want out of life, um, and how to get from where we are now to there. So if they value, you know, socializing, going out more with friends, okay, what do we have to do in terms of your food intake to get you to the point where you're comfortable um, socializing with friends, going on dates, going to parties, et cetera. And then finally, as I mentioned previously, there are some medications that can be used off label, either to increase appetite, uh, to reduce anxiety, um, to reduce obsessive compulsive symptoms or cognitive rigidity around food. So how do we define recovery from ARFID? Um, well, recovery from ARFID looks different than recovery from anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or binge eating disorder. So, with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, the goal tends to be to get the individual back to the person that they were before they develop that eating disorder, right? So with one of these other types of eating disorders, we're looking for full weight restoration, um, return to their historic growth curve for height and weight, um, moving through puberty normally, uh, complete absence of binge purge symptoms, um, complete absence of food restriction, et cetera. So it's fairly clearly defined. We're looking back at the person that they were before developing the eating disorder and getting back to there. With ARFID, it's, it's a lot more challenging because very often these individuals don't have a normal to go back to. They may have always been very, very picky. They may have always had sensory issues around food. So they may have always been very underweight. Um, and so we don't always know where they're where their body is meant to be. We don't, we don't necessarily have a healthy eater person in mind for them to go back to. So it's quite a bit different. Um, how, do we, how do we determine whether a person is recovered or in recovery? We wanna see if their nutritional intake is good enough to sustain basic health. So are they getting enough calories, um, vitamins, nutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, et cetera? Um, are, there, are they growing and developing normally? Are they where they're meant to be in terms of height and weight? Um, again, this, it might be a guess where they're supposed to be, maybe based on um, the height and weight of their biological relatives, if it's a person who's always been um, very small for their age. We also wanna make sure that they're progressing through puberty as expected, if it's a person um, who's in early adolescence. We wanna look for um, improvement in their social emotional health and in their family functioning as well. So is the family as a whole um, functioning well enough to support this person in continued recovery, um, have the issues within the family that have been exacerbated or caused by the ARFID been worked through and dealt with? And then finally, we wanna look for a reduction in the patient's distress and an improvement in their quality of life. So does the patient subjectively say, yes, I feel better. I like my life now. You know, I enjoy my social life. I'm able to do the things that I want to do. So recovery from ARFID um, may not ever mean be, being a quote unquote normal eater. Um, oftentimes these individuals are picky eaters for life and that's okay. Um, so a person can be a very picky eater, but still um, eat enough to maintain um, normal growth and good health. Um, they can be a very picky eater and still participate in social events. So we, we wanna get them to the point that they are eating well enough to um, meet their goals socially, emotionally, and, and physically, of course. So um, I have a bit of a bibliography here, a few different um, books and articles about ARFID that I think um, are very helpful for parents as well as clinicians. And um, I'm just gonna list these up here and you can take note of them if you wish. And then finally, I want to open up the floor to questions. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And if you're not able to get your questions answered here, please feel free to email me. And I'd be glad to answer your question that way as well after the presentation. Uh, I'll start just until there are questions um, sure. in the chat. Um, I was curious, is there a minimum age to start treatment? I mean, how do you know at what point to start treatment with a child? 
That is an excellent question. I don't know that there is specifically a minimum age. Um, I do know that a lot of the individuals, especially with uh, the avoidance subtype who have um, autism spectrum disorder are often started in treatment for the autism, maybe at age two or three or four. And so sometimes along with the um, ABA or applied behavior analysis, they will do food exposures as part of that. Um, but of course, it's more complicated if the person has ARFID as well as autism spectrum disorder. So I don't know that there's a clear answer for that. I, I, my guess would be the earlier, the better, as with most, as with most things. Okay. Um, next question. Have you seen ARFID patients that have growth hormone deficiency? Is this common? My son has both, and I believe it's from being malnourished and underweight for so long. The answer is yes. Um, it's, it's fairly common for individuals with ARFID to have growth hormone deficiencies. And I think usually it's the ARFID that causes the growth hormone deficiency, although I'm sure sometimes it's the other way around. So I think it's really important for the endocrinologist and the pediatrician to be, um, to be informed um, of how malnutrition affects growth hormones, because sometimes, you know, again, this is a child maybe who's always been in the third percentile for height and weight. So they're seen as just someone who's always been small, but there can be a malnutrition component um, that's kept them at the very, very low end of the growth curve. Okay. Um, next question. Who do you think should be responsible for treatment decisions? Psychiatrist, pediatrician, GP, someone else? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, I, I, I think ideally it would be a collaboration. Um, I think that um, it, whomever is in charge of treatment decisions should be someone that's very, very knowledgeable about ARFID and someone who knows the child very well. So in, in my particular case, um, I tend to be the leader of the treatment team um, because I would you know, see the child and family weekly. I get to know them very well. And I also have expertise in the treatment of ARFID. But you know, if there's a decision about medication, then in that case, it would be deferred to the pediatrician or um, it, maybe there would be a psychiatrist on the team as well. Okay, so someone, someone came up with my question that I was running through my head too. Um, do you work alongside a dietitian or nutritionist as standard? Um, we don't have access to this resource advice in my team. Would it be possible to work without this input? It's definitely possible to work without a dietitian. Um, in, in fact, with an FBT treatment model, a dietitian is usually not used. The dietitian could be used, but is usually not used. So with, with CBT and FBT, a large component of the treatment is focused on nutrition education, meal planning, et cetera. So it, it may actually be kind of redundant to have a nutritionist or dietitian along with the therapist. So to answer your question, it absolutely can be done without a nutritionist or dietitian um, and can be done very successfully without. In some cases, um, if there's a particular special need, like for example, if a child has celiac disease or severe food allergies, then um, food planning could be a bit more challenging. And in a case like that, a dietitian could be very, very helpful, but I would say definitely not necessary in most cases. Um, okay. Um, you kind of answered this question, um, but I just ask it anyway. Um, is the treatment of ARFID um, with a multidisciplinary team or only with a psychologist? It depends entirely on the situation. In some cases, it can be with a multidisciplinary team. Um, it, the team could involve a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a pediatrician, and dietitian. In other cases, it's not. Um, in my experience personally, typically it's myself and the pediatrician. And again, like I said, sometimes there's a consultant dietitian if there are particular nutritional needs that we're looking at, but usually it's, um, it's myself and the, the child's pediatrician. Although in, in other cases, in other treatment facilities, there may be more people involved. Um, okay, and how do you analyze nutritional intake and adequacy without the dietitian? I mean, I assume it's experience, but if, yes. Can you give a broader answer than that? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's experience. Um, so we want to look at the person's um, blood work and vital signs and growth chart. 
So um, if nutritional intake is adequate, then we expect the person to have um, normal vital signs. We expect them to be growing normally. We expect them to be progressing through puberty. We expect their, um, you know, their blood work to be normal, et cetera. Um, pediatricians can often run blood tests that will help to determine if the person is well-nourished. Um, so clearly that's not as, um, as thorough as like a, a, a dietary analysis that a dietitian would do. If the person needs something more thorough than that, then yes, I think a, a referral to a dietitian would definitely be warranted. But most of the time, you can tell through, you know, through experience and through uh, collaboration with the pediatrician, whether the person's nutritional intake is sufficient. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to paraphrase one of these questions and ask, um, how do you know when to use FBT? You mentioned FBT and CBT. Um, yes. How do you know when to use which module, meaning what, what leads you toward one as opposed to the other? Um, a few different things. In my, in my personal experience, in my practice, I very often use a hybrid of the two um, because the symptoms, uh, there are some symptoms that I feel are best addressed with the FBT component and other symptoms that are best addressed with the CBT component. So I believe if a person is on the younger side, a child or a young adolescent, FBT would tend to be the preferred way to go because those individuals tend to need a tremendous amount of, of parental support. Not to say that they don't when they're older, but oftentimes there's more autonomy when they're older. But even in a case of like, I'm thinking of some very young children that I have with ARFID right now who are you know eight, nine, 10 years old, the, the FBT component in terms of empowering the parents, um, meal monitoring, meal support, et cetera, is very, very important. But there's also an exposure therapy component, um, which is part of CBT, that we have to use when a person has a significant fear of choking or vomiting. So that's something that I think um, CBT can address better. So I guess my personal opinion would be kind of a hybrid of the two models, um, in many cases, is probably going to be most effective. Um, have you seen extreme hunger in a patient in recovery from ARFID? In anorexia, that seems to be quite common. I, so I have seen it. I don't think it's quite as common in recovery from ARFID, in part because some of these individuals are never um, calorically malnourished. So for example, those with the, the um, those who have the sensory sensitivity and tend to have just a small number of, um, of preferred foods, they may never be calorically malnourished or underweight, but they may have other, you know, vitamin deficiencies, et cetera. So in that case, hunger is not necessarily an issue. For some individuals, like the ones um, who have always had a very poor appetite and have always been very underweight and don't get much pleasure for food from food, I have seen in those individuals, once they start eating more, they start experiencing a lot of hunger. And it's actually, for them, it's wonderful. It's kind of very different from a child recovering from anorexia who's afraid of that. But someone with ARFID, um, or I've seen this a few times, when someone develops those hunger cues and is finally able to respond to them, it's like they're coming alive again. So to answer your question, yes, I have seen that, but that's not the case in, in all or even most people with ARFID. Um, it seems like so many health professionals, pediatricians, et cetera, have no understanding of ARFID or just dismiss it as picky eating. What do you recommend to ARFID parents and caregivers for helping others like physicians and family members get it? Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult question. Um, I would recommend education. Um, send them articles that, um, that are reader friendly, um, talk with them. Um, and it, it can be very hard to do, especially with a pediatrician who has maybe hundreds of other patients. Um, with family members, um, if they're open to learning, sometimes it can be very, very helpful to sit with them, educate them, you know, read things together, tell them a little bit about a day in your life so that they can get maybe a little bit of a better understanding of what goes on. Um, unfortunately, I think there's there's even less understanding of ARFID than there is of other types of eating disorders. And even the understanding of other types of eating disorders is, is still fairly poor in a lot of people. So I think there we have a lot of growth to do in that area as, as a healthcare community. Okay, um, how do you treat ARFID that is morphed into restrictive anorexia nervosa without body image issues? Interesting. I've seen that happen a few times. So with, with those particular cases, I would tend to just continue along with the FBT or the CBT that we're using. It, it would look very similar, if not identical, to standard FBT for 
fat phobic anorexia. It's just that we wouldn't necessarily be contending with all of those body image cognitions. So we would continue ahead with the, um, you know, with the meal support, um, with the weight restoration, et cetera, and then handing back control to the child as they determine readiness. Okay. Um, as a dietitian, how do I determine which practitioner should handle the exposure therapy parts, dietitian or therapist? This seems to ride the lines of scope of practice a lot of time for both practitioners. Right. That's a great question. You know, actually, I just as fairly recently had a, a conversation with a dietitian. The, the patient uh, was a young child. Uh, the parents had reached out to both myself and the dietitian, um, and she is very well versed in eating disorders, including ARFID. And she actually said to me, I don't think this family needs me as in the dietitian. I think they should just work with you because what we would be doing would be very redundant. So this particular dietitian would have used exposures and, and um, things of that nature to treat the child. So um, I, I guess to answer your question, whoever it is that has training and experience using the exposure therapy should be the one to do it. If both parties have that training and experience, then perhaps it would be all the better for, for both of the clinicians to do the exposures. Maybe that would, would be even more helpful. Okay, um, final question. Um, as COVID has happened and less social things have taken place, my teen hasn't wanted to meet up with friends to do things. I encourage daily and he says he's okay. Any suggestions on what else we can do to encourage him to be social? I mentioned go grab ice cream because he will eat that and it would be easy for him around others, but he's not interested. Oh, wow. That's a very challenging question that I think kind of goes beyond the scope of ARFID treatment, maybe more into, I, I'm not sure what your son's issues are. I, I would recommend continuing to encourage him, maybe even encouraging him to sign up for an activity um, if he's interested in something like music or art or a book club or, I don't know, a youth group, something of that nature where he would be almost required to interact with other kids his age. Of course, that would require him having some interest in something, but um, I think something like that, some type of organized activity could be useful. Thank you. Um, okay, we're pretty much at the end of our time. Um, so I want to thank you so very much. Um, I profess that I know the least about ARFID than any other eating disorder. Um, and this was incredibly informative for me and I'm sure for everyone else here as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, for answering all our questions. Um, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. And, um, I just want to let everyone know that our next webinar, um, will be taking place in September. I know that we have a slide. I don't see it up here. Um, and offhand, I don't remember the date, <laughs> but it, uh, hold on a second. Okay. Please donate. I said that before. This one, um, September 14th at 3.30 p.m. EST. Um, Beth Mayer, who's another one of our clinical advisors, is going to be speaking on supporting your loved one struggling with bulimia nervosa. So please join us for that one. Um, and also anyone who wasn't here obviously is not here, um, but you can let any of your colleagues or your friends know um, that this webinar will be online within a few days um, on the FEAST website so people can take a look um, and catch what they missed. So thank you everyone so much for participating. Thank you, Dr. Raven, for giving this great webinar, and we hope to see you all next month. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I enjoyed doing this. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.